All right, let's look at we're in Acts chapter 28, last chapter in Acts. And um, what we're going to see here is uh, we're going to finish up. Remember, we left off on that shipwreck, right? And we saw these, the, we saw Paul and those that were on, with him, how they shipwrecked on this island. And then we're going to kind of finish up what happened there, and then we're going to see what happens to them from that point on. And then Paul's final destination is then realized, and he finally gets to where? To Rome. All right, and that's what we're going to be uh, looking at. So uh, let's go ahead and do our reading portion now. So let's get right into it. Acts chapter 28. Let's take a listen. Chapter 28. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people shewed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence, we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum, and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came shewed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him. 
preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. For the music, that, turn, that, that finishes up the, uh, the book of Acts. All right, now let's, uh, let's take a look and see where, uh, where this book um, leaves us at the end of its, uh, its conclusion on this last chapter. Now remember, on last week we talked about that shipwreck and how it was tossed and turned and, and all the, 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 the lessons that we learned about God's will in our life and patience and how we're trying to go one place and God's trying to, trying to let us know there's a certain other uh, avenue that I want you to go with. And yet, um, in doing all of that, still God's will is done. The bottom line was that Paul was not going to die in that storm. Because in order for him to die in that storm, that would then mean that when God told him beforehand that he would go to Rome, that he wouldn't go. So there, there are some things that we have to keep in mind that when the Lord gives us things and, and puts in our hearts, and, or if, even if we're not understanding what it is, when God in his own uh, uh, will has decided that certain things are going to happen, it doesn't matter what happens prior to it, doesn't matter what's going on, don't matter how people uh, uh, react to what uh, the ingredients are to develop that, that thing to come to pass, it's going to happen. So when we read in the Bible, when it says that, um, that Israel will be the, a, a center of activity and everybody would, would, would fight against it. And look at our history. Look at, look at throughout history. Look at today. What is all that stuff in the Middle East all about? Israel. It's all about Israel. Now you go back into the 20s and the 30s, people were like, well, why would anybody be interested? Actually, you go back a little further. You go back into, go back into like the 1700s. You know, the Bible was written long before that. But why would anybody in the 1700s think that anybody would be interested in anything that's going on in the Middle East? 1800s, kind of, you know, early 1800s, they wouldn't care either. And really, not until they discovered one valuable resource in, in the Middle East, which was called what? Oil. Oil. Did that region ever even become a place where anybody would be concerned about? Why, was, why would anybody be concerned about a bunch of sand? underneath all that saying there's some oil so the Bible knew that that region way back when it was written before even what we're reading now before Acts when the prophets and Isaiah and all, were talking about all that the Lord knew that that region would be very viable and very uh, 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 focused on during the last days how it was going to be we didn't know but now today we know we know why it's so so I'm saying all that to say this, that when God told Paul he was going to go to Rome, he was going to Rome. Shipwreck, whatever the case may be, and it's the same thing in our lives. When, when God has for you, he says he has good things for you, and, and, and he has uh, ways to bring you out, and that your family's going to be going to, to know the Lord, and so forth and so on. When God gives you confidence, don't worry about it. Now, you may go through stuff like what Paul did. Paul went through all kinds of obstacles. He went through all kinds of difficulties. He had to persuade, uh, 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 sell his case to, to the Jews time and time and time again, trying to explain to them that he's not trying to destroy the nation of, of, uh, uh, of the Jews. He's trying to build the Hebrew nation. And he's trying to show them that their hope is in Christ, though they didn't see it. But it didn't stop him from doing what he knew he needed to do. All right? So... Um, with all that said, we see that Paul ended up at this island and they were shipwrecking. So we start at the very first verse and it says, And when they had escaped, then they knew that the island was called Miletus. All right? Or, or Meltas, I'm sorry. And the, the, and the uh, barbarous people showed them no little kindness. All right? So basically what they're saying is they're looking at the, the, these people and, and they're they're not showing them a little kindness, they're showing them what? Much kindness. All right, so they're being very hospitable and very friendly. And they kindled a fire and received everyone because of uh, the present rain and because it, of the cold. Right? So now, you could keep, it's still raining. It's still chilly and cold because, remember, they were, they were trying to harbor for the what? For the winter. All right? It says, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks 
And see, he's out there working too. He's, everybody's out there trying to gather some sticks. We got to build a fire. He's out there gathering sticks too, and and laid hand and, and laid them in the fire. Uh, there a viper, a viper out of the heat, and fastened on his hand. So what happens? You know, when it's cold, what happens to snakes? They stiffen up because they're cold-blooded animals. But when that snake got next to that heat, he began to what? Move around. And he then jumped right on Paul's hand. Now, I don't think it no accident that that, that that snake bit Paul. Because what is the, what, what is, um, the main goal of the enemy? Is to stop you from doing what, what, what God said you were going to do. So I don't even think the storm was just something that was just arbitrary. The storm was manufactured, I think, by the enemy, by the devil, to disrupt Paul's journey to Rome because God said he was going to go. I think this venomous snake, once again, is the devil's attempt to try to get you from doing what you, what God says you can do, which is why you have to have faith and trust and confidence in the Lord. And, and it's a lot of times more difficult than it is uh, to say than it is to do. Because when you're hurting, you're hurting. When you don't have, you don't have. When you're struggling, you're struggling. But we got to learn to build our muscles spiritually on the Lord and just be confident even in those times. And the more we go through stuff, a lot of times the more we begin to learn, you know what? I've learned to be confident. I've learned to just trust the Lord. The struggles will come. I know God's going to bring me through. I'm not going to sit and be idle. I'm going to do what my hands find to do. But in the doing of it, my soul is going to be at rest, confident in that God's going to bring me through. Even though I have to do certain things, I got to go through certain processes, but I'm not going through it alone. I'm going through it with the help of God. All right, so this snake reaches in, and so then the, the barbarians saw the, the venomous beast hanging on Paul's hand, and they among themselves said, No doubt this man is a murderer. Whom. Uh, thought he had escaped from the sea. So they're, they're thinking, this man is a murderer. The sea was going to try to gather his life, and when the sea couldn't gather his life, yet vengeance suffered him not to live. And now, here comes a snake going to take his life. Verse 9, and he shook off this, the, 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 uh, the beast into the fire and fell no harm. All right? And all of a sudden, nothing happened. Hands not swelling up. He's not turning blue. All right? Verse 6, how be it, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after he had looked a, a great while and saw no harm come on him, they changed their minds. You see that? Quickly, they changed their minds. They're like, oh, wow, this man, he must be something else. And what did they say? And said, he is a what? Oh, he is a God. <laughs> now, see, but that happens when you have people that are what, God, what, what the Bible calls them barbarians or people that have no biblical or, or godly training. They, they, they will call things incorrectly. And this happens today. We got a lot of people that are so-called scholars, but because they have no biblical training, can't talk on spiritual things. You can't understand things that are spiritual by intellect. So you got to you got to use what the Bible and the, and, the, and the words of the Lord, um, and, and just trusting that the Lord will speak to you through His Scripture. So these barbarians they go from calling him a murderer and someone that de someone that deserves death to a god. They don't, they don't have no understanding as to how to see how God is working. But then, while Paul is there, we'll see this. While Paul is there, he's actually teaching them. Now, take this in consideration. Here's people out there that don't have no real biblical training, no real godly training, no training or no knowledge about Christ. It just so happens that from the storm, who lands on their island? Paul. What is Paul going to do? He's going to be there for the whole winter. What is he going to be doing there? Preaching. He's going to be teaching them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. In the same quarter uh, were uh, possessions of a chief man of the island whose name was uh, Publius, who received us and lodged us three days uh, courteously. All right. So now this man here, he's he's receiving um, Paul and his band and treating them very nice. Verse eight. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick with a fever and of the the bloodly flux, uh, to whom Paul uh, entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now, 
Paul is letting me know the God I serve is the God of everything. Not only did he deliver me from the sea, and not only did he deliver me from this snake, but the Lord can heal your father. He can do all of this. And he goes in there and he shows these people what, what God can do. And he heals in verse 6. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Now the word done got out. You see that? Right. That's, that's, that was God's calling card a lot of times when people, when the disciples initially would go into to areas. And remember, they didn't have a Bible back then. They, 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 they couldn't go to the corner bookstore or to the Walmart and pick up a New Testament. So in order to get their, their attention, the Lord oftentimes would use miracles in the beginning to get their attention, to get their focus. Because they didn't have, you know, ways of communicating truth like we have today. Now today, God, he's still a healing God, but for the most part, God's word is what will convert people. Always remember Jesus' statement to that rich man that died and found himself in hell. Remember the Bible said that when the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell. And that rich man said, let me go back and tell my brothers. And, and uh, the Lord said, no, you, you can't go back. And the man tried to convince him. He said, but if one person, if a person come back from the dead, they will believe. So he, he's thinking that it's the miracles that are going to make a person believe. And the Lord said, no. Let me tell you something. If they don't hear Moses and the law and the prophets, neither will they hear if one come back from the dead. The key is not to get all caught up in all the, the hoopla because what people in, in the future when the Antichrist comes are going to be deceived by great lying wonders. They're going to have the, the prophet, this false prophet's going to come and he's going to do things that are considered miraculous or miracles. And then he's going to draw people after them. But see, that's not what we follow now. We follow his what? His word. But in the beginning, before the word was established, before it was written like this, before it was presented in the volume of a book, because remember, Jesus said, Lo, I come what? In the volume of a book. So now the Lord Jesus is here with us. He says, my spirit is in my word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was God. So when you have the word here, imagine that. The word was what? God. You, you are reading God. God's talking to us through his what? Word. Through his word. That's right. And we have to remember that. Oftentimes we forget that. And therefore we don't put a lot of pref uh, uh, precedence on the word. They put a, a lot of people put a whole lot of precedence on a lot of other stuff that's in and around the Christian experience. You got a lot of people, man, they'll, they'll listen to, to all the Christ, Christian music and they go to all these Christian plays and concerts and and I'm not against that. I think that's wonderful, and I'm happy for them, and I enjoy some of them too, but I'm not going to put it on par or anywhere close to his word. His word is above all. Yes, sir. His word is so important, he said, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will stand forever. That's right. The word will stand forever. Because Why? Because the word is God. God says, I am in this word. I am here. I speak through this word. All right? And so, therefore, when we're reading the word, we're reading, it's like when President Obama writes you a letter, whose authority is in that letter? Obama. If President Obama writes a letter and say, I don't care what you people say in Beacon, uh, Haywood Matthews is not to pay any more taxes to the city of Beacon. Now, it don't matter what anybody, when you got, when you got that letter, you say, Obama said, I don't got to pay any more taxes. Now, did Obama come to you in person? Did he say it to you face to face? No. He said it to you where? In that letter. And that letter is him. This letter represents Obama. Obama said, you don't got to pay another dime in taxes. Well, it's the same thing with this word. God gave us this word. It was his writing. He, he wrote it. It represents him. So therefore, when it says something, it is God saying it. And that's how we have to always remember when we go through the scripture. This is God speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just not it's, not, it's not, it's not King James. Mm -hmm. You know, King James ain't speaking this. Mm -hmm. It may be his language, but the, the, the words that are spoken here are the words of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And therefore, God speaks to us through his word. All right. So let's move along here. Um, 
when I leave off at. Yes, it was. It says, so when it was done, others also came and they were all healed. It says, in verse 10, it says, uh, who also honored us with many honors. And when uh, we departed, they loaded us, they, they laden us with such things as, as necessary. In other words, so now when they're getting ready to leave, now they're on this, uh, this island this whole winter. And now they're getting ready to leave. And these people are so grateful for what Paul has done that they make sure they have everything they need for their journey because they still got to get to where? Get to Rome. Verse 11. And after three months, see, they sit there the whole winter, three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which was uh, wintering in the Isles. All right? So there was another ship nearby that was wintering there as well. All right? And now when that ship began to leave, they boarded that ship, whose sign was uh, uh, Castia or, or, and, and uh, Pollux. Now, a little study on that. Those, this, was a, this was a zodiac symbol for um, Gemini. All right? It was a Gemini symbol. Was, so they had that Gemini symbol on the front of that ship. Mm -hmm. So they, they entered on that ship. Now, why that, that's in there, I don't know, but I guarantee you at some point, it, 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 you know, I, I got to go and do a little bit more digging on that. There's a point for, for that being in it. And that's one thing we should always keep in mind. There was not a single word, not a single anything in the scripture that's irrelevant. That doesn't mean something. It doesn't have a point. The, 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 the scripture says, when you do, the one, the one, the scripture that you just quoted, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. But then uh, Jesus also said that uh, nothing shall be taken from this word, not a jot nor a tittle, to all be what? Fulfilled. So that means that every word, every letter, every punctuation in scripture means something and has a meaning. And that's one thing to always keep in mind when you're reading the word. There are no incidental uh, uh, comments or, or markings. And we'll see that a lot more, especially when we get into uh, the the, uh, the writings of Paul, and then when we begin to do a, uh, a, a go back and we start doing the Old Testament, we'll see how um, just how important every little symbol is and every little word. All right, so let's move along. Uh, verse twelve it says, "And landing in Syracuse, we tarried there for three days." So then they're starting to move, and thus and from thence we fenced. And, and we fetched a compass and came to uh, uh, Reginium. And after uh, a day, and the south wind blew, and we came the next day to uh, Pomptilii. All right, so now they're moving. You see all these different places that they're going to. Verse 14 says, We found brethren that were desirous to tarry with them seven days, and so we, we went towards what? Rome. All right. So that they're, they're moving, they're traveling, and as they're going, they're meeting other people there that were familiar with them, and they're, they're spending time with these individuals. But in all that they're doing, they're, Paul is making his way to Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came and met uh, us as far as, as uh, uh, Apollon, uh, to Forium, and, and the three... Uh, Taravans. Now, basically, I'm just saying this is an area where there were three popular ports that they were able to recognize and probably very familiar, and they began to meet there. And when Paul s saw, he thanked God and took courage. And these, seeing these people who were encouraging Paul made him uh, feel good. He was able to, to build his strength. Seeing people there that, that were uh, that were kind to him, that cared for him, that understood his, his circumstances, and wanted to see his success. And that gave Paul strength. And that's why it's important to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody that you know is praying for you. Somebody that's concerned about your situation. Somebody that, that you can go to and you can talk to. Not about the stock market. Not about how business and, and, and all the oil prices, but you can talk to about the Lord. That will encourage you to know I can move on in the, in the things of the Lord, which will help you with all the, all the other stuff that you're dealing with. All right? You can take courage from those things, knowing that the Lord is with 
with me and he's also working in the lives of other people. Don't you love it when you see the Lord bless other people? Amen. Because then you can see God is really good. He's he blessed that. And that's one of the things that can really tell a, a, a real saint because a, a good person of the Lord is not envious of other people. When somebody else is blessed, you just, you happy to see that God is working because that gives you the, because you know God is just showing that he is still in the midst of just being involved in the lives of his people. And it makes you feel good to see God blessing other people. You know, and it's just, it's just nice to see. Now, there are certain people that don't agree with that. Some people think, if God ain't blessing me, I ain't happy. <laughs> no, it's okay. Let God bless other people because that, lets me, that gives me courage to know that God is blessing. And that, you know, if the, if, it's, if the lot falls on me to get out of circumstances or trouble or difficulties, I know that it's not going to happen any other means by, by, but by the means of what? Of the Lord. So, therefore, it gives you courage. It allows you to stay strong. That's what happened to Paul here. All right? Verse 17, actually no, verse 16, it says, And when we came to Rome, when we came where? To Rome. Ah, he's at Rome. The centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. So all the prisoners that were traveling with Paul, the centurion, or the, the person guarding them, delivered them to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier, that kept him. So Paul had a private house where he could stay with one soldier watching him because they knew Paul was not a risk to, to run. He was not, he was not a, a, a vicious criminal. So Paul did not go into the, the main jail. Paul went to a private house and they brought a soldier in there just to keep eye on him so they could say we got somebody watching him. Alright? So that's what's going on now. Alright? And in verse 17, it says, And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews. So now he's in Rome, and he's calling the chief Jewish leaders that are in Rome now together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, I thought I, 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 thought I had uh, committed nothing against the people or custom, or our fathers, yet have I delivered, was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem to the hands of the Romans. Verse 18, who when they had examined me uh, would have let me go uh, because there was no, uh, no cause of death in me. Right, so now he's saying, he's, he's reviewing them. He says, you know, I was, you know, uh, delivered a prisoner from, from Jerusalem to Rome, remember he was there, he, he was in the, the, um, the uh, prison of Festus and Felix, remember? Mm -hmm. And then he was also there when King Agrippa came, and he says, and I was there, and they found no, no cause of death in me, verse 19. And when the Jews spake against me, I um, constrained to appeal to Caesar. He appealed to Caesar, which is why he's now having to go to Rome. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of it. Now, I'm not trying to accuse the Hebrew people. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you. And I, that's why I'm calling for you, the Hebrew leaders in Rome. I care about my nation, he's trying to say. He's trying to bring a persuasive argument here. To see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel am I... Uh, Bound with these chains. It's because I love Israel. It's because I want Israel to prosper. Is the reason why I'm bound with these chains. Because if Israel don't listen to Christ, they are denying their Messiah. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to see. And he's trying to get them to see that, that, that our, our Hebrew people, we have to accept Christ. We're, and it's going to happen. Remember what we said before. Nothing that God has designed to happen will not happen. It will happen. Now, Israel will call for Christ to come and save them. But that's not going to happen until, uh, the, uh, till, till the, uh, the, the tail end of the tribulation, that seven-year period of woe. Now, you're looking on the news. You saw what happened with all them tornadoes recently, right? Mm -hmm. all right? And that was tragic. And you see how devastating it can be. Imagine that happening across something, something tragic like that across the whole country. 
see, tribulation is going to be like that. It's a place, it's, it's, a, it's not a time that, I mean, they're not going to be able to keep up. And, and CNN and Fox and all, they're not going to be able to cover all the stuff that's going to be happening. And, that, and not just in America, but a global situation. Things are happening here, things are happening all over. It's just going to be amazing. But um, when you look at something like that, it makes your heart feel bad because this is what happens when all of a sudden the mercy and the grace of God begins to pull back. And now what happens is judgment has to come. You have to now get your reward. And when the Lord pulls back his mercy and his grace to a degree that, that, that judgment comes, I mean, the sins that are, that are laid upon you are pretty bad. You know, it reminds me, I thought of it, I mean, the story of Habakkuk. Habakkuk said, that, Lord, I can't, I don't understand why you're not helping us. We're, we're struggling through this and we're going through difficulties. And we need your help. And the Lord tells Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I am going to help. But if I help, if I tell you how I'm going to help, you won't believe it. And Habakkuk's like, I do, I will believe it. Just tell me, I want to know how you're going to help. And then, um, y'all looking at that spider? Yeah. And then so, um, Habakkuk's like, no, listen, Lord, I will believe you. Just tell me what's going to happen, and I, I, I will believe. So the Lord finally tells Habakkuk what's going to happen. I'm going to allow the Babylonians to come in and overthrow your nation. And then and Habakkuk's like, what? You're going to allow the enemy that's worse than us come in and conquer us? How is that going to help us? And Habakkuk couldn't understand it. But the beautiful part about it is that you got to look at it from this standpoint. God says that woe unto him that afflicts Israel. So then... Israel needs to humble itself. So God's going to allow an enemy that needs punishment, that is even worse, acting worse than the Hebrew people who are acting, to come in and punish the Hebrew people. Now that's going to make the Hebrew people humble themselves and call out to God. But then, what does that do to the amount of judgment that is owed to the people that come in and attack, attack Israel, the Hebrew people? What's going to happen to their amount of judgment? It does what? It increases, doesn't it? So God is saying, I'm going to let, your, I'm going to let your, the, the wrath that's going to come upon you get till it's what? Full. And that's a, that's, see, I'm like, Lord, knock me over before, before my cup of, of, of judgment gets just a little bit. You know, get me straight. Because if you allow me to continue in my evil ways and I fill my cup of you know, that's why it's good to know the Lord. And you can, that's why it's good to repent and to let the Lord know you're sorry. Because that keeps that cup empty and it keeps keep it full with the grace of the Lord and the covering of Jesus. But when the devil comes, and that's a part, the part, and all of the people that, that, that work in his plan, and he, they afflict the people of God, all that's doing is increasing their wrath, God's wrath on them, and then giving us the opportunity to humble ourselves. Remember, the scripture says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall first, what? Humble themselves. Pray. pray and turn. Seek my face. And what? Turn from their evil ways. Then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. And so, but a lot of times, the, the humbling part, that first piece is the part that we don't do. And the Lord will allow affliction sometimes to come. That does what? Humbles you. It also makes you do what? Pray. Pray. Yeah, oh yeah. Then you begin to do what? Seek God. God. And then, if you really have God in you, then you will also turn right. from your evil ways. Now, some people, when trouble comes, they will humble, mm -hmm. and they will pray, oh, God, help me, and they will seek God, mm -hmm, but, they, will but they, they, won't, they won't turn from the evil ways. Mm -hmm. So you got to complete the whole packet right. in order to do it. And that's the problem that we have in... Uh, in our nation and in the nation across all, all, a lot of folks, all kinds of people have that same problem. I mean, we got issues over there in Europe and America is just, just as bad and, and unfortunately the Lord's going to allow things to happen uh, that will force us to be to make a decision. Are we going to humble ourselves? Are we going to pray? All right. But the, the, the thing about it is don't, don't worry. God knows what he's doing. When he allows uh, the enemy to, to attack good folks he is 
increasing the eternal reward of the person that was attacked and also increasing the eternal punishment of the person that what? Did the attack. And so you got to look at the God knows what he's doing. Now, that's just God revealing it from a, uh, an aspect of Habakkuk. When you, we really deal with it, God's going to deal with it with a, a, a total justification that I probably can't even explain. I can't even bring the proper understanding as to how God will deal with those that are afflicted and deal with those that are afflicted. And Jesus even said, it, it is necessary that, that uh, offenses come, but woe to them by whom they come. So Jesus is saying, yes, I need the afflictions to come to help keep my people in line. But woe unto those people that allow themselves to be the one that torments my people. And he also said, uh, woe unto him that would hurt one of these what these little ones. It would be better that a, what, a millstone be tied about his neck and he be thrown into the, the, the sea. So afflictions and difficulties that come upon us, a lot of times we buck and scream and holler and, and cry to the Lord, but in reality, God is really increasing our in eternal glory. And then we wonder how come these other people that got all these riches and are so evil and all that, and they have all this stuff, and they just they, they just living the life of luxury and cutting our salaries and, and laying folks off that need to have families and, and, and treating people bad and all kinds of uh, evil rules and regulations and stuff are happening. Those people, are all they're doing is increasing their eternal judgment. And it's sad when you think of it that way. And that, but, that, but that's why you really want to be on the right side of the Lord when all this stuff is said and done. Remember, nobody lives in this world forever. This world will pass away. We're going to live in a new world. But how you living in that new world, that is what's going to be important. Right? And we're going to be birthed into that new world. It's just like a time when a, when a, when a, a, a mother is, um, is conceived and have a baby. That baby is in that world of the womb for nine months. But there come a time when that baby's got to come out of that world and live in what? This world. Well, it's the same thing with us. And remember, and Jesus oftentimes talks about the coming of this new age as a woman in travail or a woman in labor. Mm -hmm. And the times, and he says that when, the, when we'll know that the time is near because the birth pains will be increased and will be more severe. So we look at you know, what we see in the news and we begin to see, okay, that looked like a, you know, like a little kick right there, but like some little things going on, you know? <laughs> you know? But it, it, it don't look like it's time to deliver yet. But I do see this world going into that stage where it's going to start continuing. Now that these bird pains begin to, st to start, once they start, they continue on, they continue on, and then at some point they begin to get even more intense and more frequent until it's time to look. And this is what Jesus told us. He said, look and watch like you're watching a woman ready to deliver. You look for those signs. That's what the description that he gave us to look for and to look. So when you watch the news, you look for that stuff. You read the paper, you look for it. You look in your community, in your town, in your world, you look to see, are they increasing? Are they more frequency? And so, you know, to me, it looks like there's a little bit of a consistency of increase going on. But yet, the time is not yet. We still got to tell people about the goodness of the Lord and get people to believe and trust Him. And we're going about our daily lives. We don't do like these other people. Well, that must mean the rapture's coming and they folks quitting their jobs and doing all this other stuff. I'm like, you know, these people don't read the Bible. Because you cannot set a day. You cannot tell me it's coming this day. It's not going to happen. That's not scripture. Jesus said just watch for the what? Birth pains. But you don't know when it's going to come. You just know it's what? It's coming. All right? All right. Now that I got off on, on that uh, thing, where was I? I think I was in 19. Yes. It says, but when the Jews spake against me, uh, uh, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, unto Caesar. Uh, not that I had any ought against my nation. For this cause, therefore, have I called you to see you and to speak with you because 
that of the hope of Israel am I in these and the, these chains bound with these chains. Twenty one. And they said unto him, We neither receive letter out of Judea concerning thee. Now these are the these are the, the Jewish leaders. They said we didn't see any, receive any letter out of the Jewish leaders in Judea concerning thee. Neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. So we don't know nothing about what you're talking about. It's what these Jewish leaders in Rome are saying. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. Uh, for as concerning this sect, uh, we know that, and this sect is considered those that are following Jesus, we, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. All right, so what, he, what they're saying is now, but what we do know is that this sect that you're talking about, these followers of Jesus, everywhere we, that we hear, people are speaking against it. They're not for it. But remember, these are the Jewish leaders that are trying to, to maintain a somewhat traditional mosaic uh, 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 leadership going on uh, and, and, uh, and, and rituals going on when Christ came and has already fulfilled it. And now saying it is now that the mosaic writings and all the writings of Moses has been fulfilled, you now have to follow after me. Moses told you that there was going to be one that's going to come like unto me. When he comes, you are to do what? Hear him. All right? And so what, this is what Paul is saying. That person that Moses talked about has come, and it's Jesus. And they're not receiving that. They're not believing it. All right? Verse 23. And when they had a, appointed him a day, uh, there came many to him uh, unto the lodging, to whom he expounded and testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. See, he's teaching out of the, out of the writings of Moses and out of the prophets. From morning until evening. All right, now. He's having this all day uh, Bible study with all these different people. We're out of his lodging, right out of his house. All right? And they're coming in and they're listening and he's talking to them from the morning time to the evening. So you can just see some people coming and they, 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 they're sitting there and listening and they're asking questions and going back and forth. And so, well, I got to leave. I got to go to work, but I'll be back tomorrow. And you can just see it. Paul's just sitting there just, just talking, just explaining, just telling them about the good. Imagine just being in one of those, those, those Bible classes where Paul's sitting there and he's going, he's talking about, he's going from Moses and the prophets, talking about how Christ is the fulfillment of all that was written of Moses, of all that was written by the prophets. Christ is the fulfillment of all of that. All right? 24. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some, what? Not. Believe not. not. See, that goes to show you. I, mean, I, I don't know how to, how to, how to um, equate or bring any type of reasoning as to why one person will hear the story of the Lord Jesus and what he's come to do for us, and they'll read that and they go, nah, I ain't believing that stuff, man. And somebody else will read it and they'll just be like broken up and they're like, oh, wow, I got to get my heart to I don't know why that happens, but it does. It happens because what Jesus said, when he talks about the, the sea, how it falls. Mm -hmm. Some falls on good ground, some fall on stony ground. Mm -hmm. it's, it's how the sea falls. What, what is hit? If you're hitting people that just don't believe, they ain't going to believe. No, they, they're not. And, and why they don't believe, I, I don't know. You know. But Jesus said that some people... The Lord has wheat, and the devil planted what? Tares. And how that all works out, how a person just can just be a tear, I don't know. I, I, you know, Judas, who walked with Jesus all them years, and still not be a believer in Jesus, was concerned more about overthrowing the government of, 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 uh, of Rome at that time, that he was concerned with the fact that he was walking with God in the flesh. His, his perspective and his, his focus was in the wrong place. And because he wasn't more focused on God than he was about achieving specific worldly goals, he never could see who Jesus was. But now the Bible says he was the son of perdition. 
So, I mean, did he even have a hope? We, you know, we look at the, we look at those types of things from the aspect that God knows the beginning from the end. Right? God said that, uh, speaking of Jacob and Esau, Jacob, I have love. Esau, I what? I have hated. And somebody said, well, how could God hate Esau before he was born? But remember, God knew Esau. God doesn't have to go through a timeline. God doesn't have to look at you and say, well, let me wait till you grow up and see what you're going to be. God already knows what you're going to be. So therefore, he knows whether you are weak or whether you are tear. He knows whether you're a child of God or whether you're a child of the devil. Jesus told the, the, um, the, uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, he said, your father is the devil. So he knew right then and there, these, these people talking to him were not going to heaven. We're not going to spend eternity with the Lord. They were going to burn in hell. He knew that. But now, I don't know that. That's why when we talk, we talk to any and everybody because for whatever reason, God can give, he, he knows. And so Jesus knew. We just have to talk to everybody. I mean, this, and anyone that we can. And as God brings people to us, we, we talk. Not knowing who will hear or who won't hear. Now here's Paul. He's talking and preaching and teaching from Moses and all these diff, diff, all the different prophets, the things concerning Christ, and you see right here, some believe and some believe not. But that's why he says, let the feet and the tail grow together. Grow together, that's right. Because he will do the separating. Because when you're down south and you see wheat, I take some of y'all down south and say, okay, show me the wheat, show me the tail. Y'all look at it. Because mm -hmm. they look so much alike. They look alike. You can't always tell the difference mm -hmm. unless you're a farmer. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we have that even today. Why some people will not believe and others will. Uh, that's the mystery that God has uh, about the heart. And there's something about our heart, who we are. And God knows it. That's the, that's the thing. 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After, uh, they departed. after that, Paul had spoken one word. Uh, well, uh, spake the Holy Ghost. By Isaiah, and that's Isaiah, the prophet, unto our fathers. And he's saying this. And he's quoting this from, from Isaiah 26, saying, Go to this people and, and say, Hear, uh, Hearing ye uh, shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall, shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and your ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have their clothes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. See, the healing takes place in us when we accept Jesus. That's spiritual. That's the greatest healing there is. There is no, there is no greater healing than this, the healing of being born again. When your heart is changed from the heart that doesn't believe in the Lord to one that does. And so now uh, uh, Paul is quoting from an Old Testament writer, a prophet, Isaiah. And Isaiah said that there were going to be people to hear and they're not going to be able to, to understand. They're going to see and they're not going to perceive. perceive. Their heart will not have understanding. Alright? So... Unfortunately, uh, this has been told way back when. It was told by Isaiah. We see it happening in Paul's day. And guess what? It is happening now. All right? People are not going. To go, are not going. Now, the thing about it is, all these folks that Paul are talking to are religious people. These are people that believe in the writings of Moses, believe in the prophets, but they don't believe in Jesus. People that believe in, in, in spiritual and mystic stuff. They believe in, you know, all this other, but don't believe in Jesus. And we got a lot of that going on today. People that believe in certain things, but they don't believe in Jesus. And that's the key. And you can say, well, I believe in God. But do you believe that Jesus is your Savior? That's the key. All right? 28. But it know, therefore, unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now what Paul is saying is 
the Hebrew people, the Jewish nation, not not hearing it. So we're gonna the the, the uh, salvation is now gonna go unto the Gentiles, and that's why we're preaching. When I say we, I talk about anybody that's a non-Hebrew, non-Jew. All right? Look at look at Christianity throughout the ages, throughout history. Now, granted, it has not been the most perfect uh, institution. It's got a lot of flaws, and today it is really corrupt. But the real teaching of it came through William, through the Gentile nations. All right, and so this is the thing to keep in mind. The Lord said that there will be Gentiles that will hear, that will hear me, and they will they will obey, and they will be saved. And that's what's happening today. All right. Um, 20, 29 and when he had uh, said these words the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves and so now they're having all of this great discussion among themselves 30 and Paul dwelt two whole years in his in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him 31 preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence no man forbidding him all right? and that brings us to the end of the book of Acts alright so we, we're, we're done there any comments or questions on what we, what we studied today or on anything that we've studied within the book of Acts